G'day. In science, it's axiomatic that extraordinary claims require extraordinary proofs. And it's also true that James Lovelock, he of the Gaia hypothesis, once famously stated that in order to do world-class research, you shouldn't need huge facilities and you shouldn't need a giant budget. He said in order to conduct world-class research, you should be able to do it in a garden shed and you should be able to fund it on the social security payment. Well, it's pretty cold and blustery out here, so how about we go into that garden shed and I'll show you the proofs that I've amassed in support of the claims I'm making for the Sunfoil project. Just duck your head. There it is, three years of mad scientistism all laid out. We begin with a fuel log that came when I bought the vehicle. In 2003, and I've been writing down every litre that's gone into it since. So this double page, for example, shows four months of fuel burn figures before I fitted the Mark I Sunfoil. And this 9.39 kilometres to the litre was a month before I even started work making it, before I'd thought the thing up. I record the litres and distance in green and every four to six weeks I crunch the numbers and I come up with an actual monthly fuel burn figure. This is when the first prototype was fitted. This has meant it's fairly easy for me to demonstrably prove that adding a 5 watt streamlined array caused the fuel burn to drop by 10 to 12 percent. And I just kept on recording everything that went in and how far I drove it. Which in time allowed me to tease out the effect of the Mark I sunfoil on the aerodynamic fuel burn reduction, the fuel burn reduction from feeding sunlight to the spark plugs, and the fuel burn reduction by having the battery pretty much full when you go to start the engine. That's uh, litres per week. The left hand column is cruising at 90 kilometres per hour, the right hand column is cruising at 100 kilometres per hour. A lot of people were worried about aerodynamic drag, so eventually I took it out on the bitumen wind tunnel and I covered it in grasshopper and sand fly marks and then I bifurcated the impact marks and I projected the centre line extension of those marks and therefore I was able to outline the boundary layer airflow by extrapolating the mosquito impact marks which caused biological organic computer modelling also known as visualise the airflow and the effect of the downwash adhering the slipstream from the roof onto the rear window glass. Six months down the track in June 2009 when the second prototype was fitted to my son's Brumby he was also trained up to keep fuel log but he fills his tank to the top. He fills it to the top when he leaves Glen Innes. He fills it to the top when he arrives in Tamworth. He fills it to the top when he leaves Tamworth. He fills it to the top when he arrives in Glen Innes. So he has amassed three different phases of data. Town driving, city driving and country highway driving. Which we display graphically <coughs> in terms of fuel efficiency over the first seven months of fitting or if you like your medicine the other way this is fuel consumption over the first seven months of fitting. This trough in fuel efficiency is what happened following three days of having the alternator disconnected and driving purely on the sunfoil. When the alternator was reconnected it really 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 sucked the fuel out of the tank and fed it to the battery. A phenomenon which this cartoon schematic fairly neatly explains. The solar panel puts current into the battery and prevents the alternator from being used as a step up belted electromagnetic drag brake which will compete with the gearbox for the torque coming out of your crankshaft. 
But it seemed it didn't matter what I said or how I said it, everybody remained sceptical. Keeping fuel records just didn't seem to do it for them. The fact that I could say with accuracy what my monthly cruising speed was and with accuracy what my monthly fuel burn was just didn't cut the ice. So I decided to uh, keep some seriously accurate records the day the third prototype Sunfoil was fitted. Today, it's 91 pages thick. The experimental observational notebook to go with the Phase 3 Magnum Sunfoil. I began recording immediately upon mounting the Sunfoil and I've recorded every engine start time and shutdown time since. The observations for the air temperatures for the inlets and the outlets and the top of the car and the air gap underneath the panel have all been recorded in the same observational notebooks. And because it's pretty hard to read a big fat wad of notes, I've made a month-long graph on each page. The top line is the number of engine starts per day. The middle line is the number of minutes average engine run per day. The bottom line is the amount of current fed into the battery before the regulator trips each day. And that's the first month. Here's the second month. That big spike there in how much current it took to trip the regulator is a direct result of using the parking lights for five minutes the previous night while unloading groceries. Along the middle here I'm recording the time of the first observation the battery resting voltage, the temperature at the time of the first observation and the time that the regulator tripped and the cloud conditions. By the third month, what I call the trigger charge had doubled, which I tend to think indicates the battery was becoming less fragile, therefore it was accepting more power in the morning before tripping the regulator because it was feeding more power to the static systems overnight. And then the next month I detected what I called a lift-off charge in that you could feed current to the battery for a significant amount of time before the voltage began to rise. I couldn't explain this strange sawtooth feature to the graph, so for the fun of it I added the phases of the moon to see if that made a difference, but it didn't. The next thing I tried to check was the geomagnetic orientation of the battery's lead plates. And lo and behold, I found there was actually a dose-response relationship, which got knocked to pieces by a lightning strike closely overhead. Apparently, the lightning's disturbance of the geomagnetic field was picked up by the plates of my battery. And that matters because if the battery storage efficiency is good, you don't burn as much fuel to charge it. And if the storage efficiency of the battery is degraded, then you'll burn a lot of fuel trying to charge a battery that won't hold the charge. So I kept paying attention. Day after day, getting up half an hour before sunrise to measure the sunrise feeding of the battery. And it was fairly rewarded when the old battery died. And my graph gave what, six days notice that it was going to happen. Now, <clears throat> I've written down the specific gravity of the electrolyte here. 1.265 for the battery that died, 1.265 for the brand new battery that was installed. And the green line is what I call the flicker float charge. The trigger charge is how much current to trigger the battery, the, the regulator, the first time. The flicker float is when you can't fit any more in. And here we are, six weeks after fitting the new battery. And the specific gravity has finally gone from 1.265 on installation to 1.295, which is almost full. So... That's how long it takes to charge a new battery. Here we have the dramatic change in battery behaviour of turning from seven or eight weeks parked perpendicular to the magnetic field 
to being parked parallel to the magnetic field. The trigger charge and the flicker float charge have glued themselves together. And then, guess who went to a rock concert? Parked perpendicular to the magnetic field for eight and a half hours, started the engine at minus three degrees with two millimetres of frost on the windscreen, drove home 65 kilometres with the headlights on full high beam, and the battery has yet to recover six weeks down the track. Remarkable, isn't it? These great big peaks are really cloudy overcast days when it's raining and there's such a low current going into the battery that it can fit more in before it triggers the regulator. And here we have, fairly dramatic, a solar flare lifted off the sun on the Tuesday and I didn't know about it. We had an overcast day. The next morning the traces were fairly normal. The next morning something was going on because it didn't take much power at all to trigger the regulator. Turned the radio news on and found that we were under impact from the plasma of a coronal mass ejection. I've never heard of anybody else using their car battery as a magnetic field strength and anomaly detector. And I didn't set out to do it. But when you crank up the scientific method of problem solving, you never really know what it is that you're going to learn. But it's all pretty interesting, and I'm not bored with it yet. Whereas I used to put a lot of effort into trying to calculate what percentage my fuel burn had improved or what percentage my fuel efficiency was improving, these figures on the right are for the third prototype Sunfoil cruising at 90 k's and cruising at 100 k's. Recently I had a bit of a breakthrough when I realised that all these percentages are just an artefact of the point that I generally drive 135 kilometres a week and 5.33 litres a week is 33% of 15 litres or so. My battery needs 3.68 amp hours per day fed to it to replace the current it loses sitting parked for 24 hours and the engine burns 207 mils of petrol per amp hour fed into the battery. So having a solar panel on the roof of my car saves 761 mils a day or 5.33 litres a week fairly regardless of how much I drive it. If I had a modern engine management computer and all the mod cons that could go as high as 22 litres a week. Now, you can make up your own mind as to whether this is evidence of obsessive compulsive disorder or whether it's a scientifically rigorous experiment. But at least I've done the experiment and I've kept the notes and I've recorded it and I've analysed it and I've graphed it. My belief is if anybody tells you that putting a streamlined solar array on a car is not going to save fuel, that person is somebody who has not conducted the experiment. And I reckon You've pretty much got two choices. You can take a fool's advice, and I am the fool on the hill, or you can do the experiment yourself. And if you're going to do the experiment, again, take a fool's advice. Don't put an interrupter switch between your panel and your battery. Just have a long base run experiment, like I did. I say that because I heard from one dingbat who put an isolation switch between his panel and his battery and he got somebody else to flip a coin and toggle the switch twice a week, once a week or once a fortnight and write the result in a diary and he didn't crunch his numbers for a year and he thought he'd eliminated placebo effect. Trouble is his anti-placebo switch was between 8 times and 32 times stronger than the effect he was attempting to detect and he fed himself a null result. Oopsie! Sadly, that dingbat was Dr. Carl Krushelnitsky, the Julia Sumner Miller Professor for Science and Education at Sydney University, and he convinced the world 30 years ago that this trick didn't work. And that's a real pity, because in that 30 years, a lot of fuel's been wastefully turned into a lot of greenhouse effect. Fit a sunfoil, now.